Hey guys, this is Jeff Stanek with Figured Out Baseball. We've got a great Figured Out Baseball podcast today with a coach who's got some videos on the website. Definitely would encourage you to check them out if you have not yet. Um, we got Mike LaRosa joining us. He's the head coach at Widener University, a Division three school in Chester, Pennsylvania. Uh, I'll give you a background on Coach LaRosa before we jump into questions with him so you know a little bit more about him, what he's done as a player and a coach. He played collegiately at Westchester University, a Division two school in Pennsylvania, a very good one at that. At Westchester, he was a four-year starter. He spent two years as a captain, as a junior and a senior. He was a four-year conference all, uh, I'm sorry, four-year all-conference player. In 2003, he was named the NCAA Division II National Defensive Player of the Year, which is pretty outstanding. Um, he hit 362 in his career at Westchester. While he was there, the team won two conference regular season titles. They went to the NCAA Regional Tournament three times. Uh, and then he was ultimately inducted into the Westchester Athletics Hall of Fame in 2017. He played one season of independent ball in the uh, Can-Am League before uh, his playing career ended. And then on the coaching side of things, he jumped into coaching, got his first coaching job uh, the springs of 2010 and 11. He was an assistant coach and recruiting coordinator at Newman University. In his two seasons there, the team went 48 and 31. And then in July 2011, he was named the head coach at Widener University. Uh, since he joined Widener, the team has won two conference championships. They have won one Southeast Region title. In 2014, Coach LaRosa was named the Conference Coach of the Year. The team has had uh, six straight wins, six, I'm sorry, six straight seasons of 20 plus wins, obviously not including 2020, where they didn't even, didn't even play 20 games. Um, he has an overall record at Widener as a head coach of 195. And 155 in conference. His teams have gone 94 and 70 since he joined Widener. Uh, his team has also had a ton of academic success. They've had nine straight years with the team having a 3.0 GPA or better every semester, and four straight years where the team has had an academic All American first time in program history. That has happened. So there's been a lot of success on the field and off the field for a team that probably does not have um, the most. Uh, resources in the conference or, or in the region. So, Coach uh, LaRosa, really appreciate you joining us for the podcast today. I'm excited to get into this with you. Yeah, Jeff, I am as well. I appreciate the kind introduction and I <clears throat> really appreciate having me on. So, I usually like to start with something from the bio that stands out. And in this part of it, uh, Mike, I'd like to start with something that you told me right before we started recording was just that when you first got to Widener, um, as the head coach, you were part time for your first three seasons now. Anybody that has been involved in college athletics of any kind knows that it, it's impossible to coach a, a collegiate team and put in part-time hours. You're always putting in full-time hours, and, and there are, you know, I, I think a lot of assistants across the country, especially uh, at almost every level that are part-time, including, you know, Division One coaches who are volunteers all the way through Division One, Two, Three junior college guys, that are part-time as assistants, but usually a lot of those guys don't have families yet, don't have kids. Uh, they're they might be doing lessons or, or you know cutting grass at the golf course or whatever to make some extra money to make ends meet. Now, for you as a head coach, obviously putting in all all the time and effort that you have to put in as a head coach, can you kind of talk through those first couple years a little bit? Just you know what you were doing uh, besides coaching to you know to earn a living to to make ends meet financially, um, and then just what that, how, how was, how was it uh, to balance the job plus what you were having to do at Widener to uh, have the kind of success that you did? And obviously in your third year there, while you were still part-time, you were named Conference Coach of the Year. So clearly you were having a lot of success on the field as well, even though you were only part-time you know, pay-wise and having to do some other things job-wise to make ends meet. Can you kind of talk about just what that was like for you at the beginning and how you overcame that uh, deficiency to have some success on the field. Yeah, definitely. So, um, if I could actually rewind it a little bit earlier. So, I just to kind of give some background. I uh, got done playing ball and started to go to work. I was working in the accounting and finance field, so I was in the business field, just working full time. Uh, you know, kind of still had my heart in baseball and, you know, was given lessons on the side, stuff like that. Um, but after a couple of years being on the workforce, I decided to get into college coaching. Like, I kind of just knew that's always where I was meant to be. So I ended up getting hooked up with uh, the head coach of Newman University who brought me on the staff. And that was 
similarly, uh, assistant position part time in pay, it was a stipend position, but I was able to get my master's degree for like 50% off tuition there. And I was able to still work. So, like, I had a, fortunately had a great boss in my day job that just allowed me to like come in early and leave early every day. So, I would get up, go to work. Uh, I would work like seven to two or six to two, kind of depending on what needed to get done. Break out of there, head up to Newman for practice. And then I was getting my master's, so right after practice, it was night class, and that was in-person classes. That was, like, before, like, everything kind of moved online with a lot of those programs. Uh, so I kind of got the schedule figured out for those two years and then was fortunate enough to get hooked on at Wagner University. And it was part-time, similar, like, stipend position, the full-time hours, certainly. So uh, that's kind of how I made it work. Like, I would get up and go to work. And then I'd leave around two and then I would head up to Widener every day and I would just, I'd be there till nine o'clock at night most times, uh, if not later, like practice. And then after practice, getting everything done as far as just an administration and organization standpoint, recruiting calls, all of that. Um, fortunately I was engaged at the time. Oh, I'm sorry. I had just got married, but we didn't have any kids yet. So like, I think if, if we had, yeah, you know, I had kids by that point, it would have been really, really probably impossible to do that because I would have never seen my family but I really understanding wife um, was able to kind of work through that schedule for a couple of years when I got on board there a mentor of mine I, I remember having this conversation I asked him you know what is it that I need to do for them to bring me on full time and his response was very simple and it was win big and I was like okay that's I guess what we got to do I got to win big and then more, more opportunities will come so I think looking at the time, it was really, really hard. But looking back, what it was able to give me is the opportunity to really prioritize thing, things um, because my time was so limited that it was the main priorities were on field player development and recruiting and then fundraising enough to get by uh, that we needed year to year from a fundraising standpoint. You know, unfortunately, I couldn't really get into alumni engagement. We couldn't get you know, a golf outing or fundraising events like that off of the ground. Um, there was just certain things that like just, you know, there just wasn't time for. So um, kind of prioritizing things, I felt like give, give me some clarity. Whereas looking back, like I can see this now, if I had taken over in a full-time capacity right away, I probably would have bitten off more than I could chew. I probably would have tried to do it all at one time and kind of, you know, I think that would have been great. But by focusing on like kind of those primary areas of player development and recruiting, like the program got better very quickly and we won a lot of games very quickly. And that opened up the possibility that I was able to come on full time because I think people just started to take notice and, and it gave me those opportunities. So it kind of was a blessing in disguise. Um, and then the other piece that I think it helped with was just the ability to manage hire and manage assistant coaches. Like I gave my assistants a ton of autonomy and freedom because it was almost out of necessity. Like anything that I felt like they could take off my plate, I gave them, you know, and I delegated it as best I could. And that also, you know, I think if I was full-time, I probably would have might, just being a young first-time head coach, I probably would have micromanaged things too much. Uh, but it gave me the ability just to know, like I had to prioritize things a little bit better. And in doing so, like I was able to delegate and manage the staff. I just, I think a lot more efficiently and, I would not have been able to do it without the assistant coaches I had. Like I had guys that were really, really dedicated to it as well. Um, and they weren't getting paid much. I mean, they were small stipend positions, but our pitching coach at the time was a wider alum. So as far as the transition, like he really helped me understand just how wider operates, uh, the recruiting niche we had there and just a lot of those things that I otherwise wouldn't have known. Um, and then I had a recruiting coordinator who was a young guy too, that, um, was new into college coaching, like fresh out of college and really just wanted to cut his teeth. So he hustled. Like he was a guy that would work really, really hard for not a lot of money, got out on the recruiting trail, really pounded the pavement. And like collectively, and I have certainly some other guys that were really great too. And collectively, like we were able to build something pretty special in, in a relatively short period of time. Um, and it's just given me a lot of clarity and perspective now looking back and, and now being full time baseball coach and just understanding again how to prioritize and manage the schedule. In the most efficient way possible. So that's uh, for people that you know that that aren't in the college athletics world. A lot of what you just talked about is so 
is so foreign to people with the amount of time that you put in. And even honestly, right now, Mike, with me, um, I'm not coaching in college anymore. I have, uh, I'm a financial planner by day. I, I run this website, but, uh, you know, thinking about putting in those kind of hours is, and uh, I have three little kids. It's a lot different now than when I coach. But thinking about putting in those kind of hours, it's like, holy cow! I can't can't imagine doing that. Um, now, with your with your staff that you've got there, and just with you know, with you being full time, can you also talk a little bit about just how much how much help you get from your assistants? Just kind of like what um, you know, for people to understand Division Three baseball, and and again, what you and your coaches deal with, you know, do you, do you have full-time assistants? Do you have part-time assistants? How many guys are you typically able to, to hang on to and, and for how long? Just kind of wondering what the assistant coach world looks like, you know, for you. You've been there for quite a long time, so I'm sure you've kind of seen a little bit of everything, but just kind of wondering what the assistant coach um, situation typically looks like there at Widener, which I, uh, I would guess is similar across the board at Division Threes. Yeah, sure. So um, we don't have any full-time assistants on staff. All the guys are part-time. Uh, stipend type positions um, where we're really fortunate is just geographically where we're located we're 20 minutes south of Philadelphia and 20 minutes north of Wilmington uh, so we're kind of in this very dense area uh, we're surrounded by two pretty big markets and because of it like I'm able to find coaches that live in the area that you know might have day jobs they might be school teachers or they, you know, might have gym jobs like I did and, and kind of have flexible schedules that they can work to earn a living and then still be, you know, at wider for practices and games and, and to kind of put things in on, you know, put time in on that end. So, like, something that I didn't even think about when I, when I like, came on board, but now, like, just having talked to colleagues that are at schools that, you know, are kind of, you know, further away from, um, you know, a, a lot of that, that dense population that we're in, for them to find coaches is tough because guys have to move into the area. For me, like I don't need guys to relocate uh, because we're not paying enough for them to do it anyway. But it gives me a chance to like get guys like really really quality assistants that are very dedicated. But usually it's guys that want to become college baseball coaches, um, you know, and, and kind of make that a career just as I did. So it's, what I'm fortunate about is I can get guys that are very dedicated and committed to it um, and to the program because you know they certainly have their individual goals and this gives them an opportunity to gain experience and develop as coaches uh, that will hopefully open doors for them down the road. And I have been like extremely blessed. Um, usually these types of positions, the turnover is really, really high, like one to two years. Um, and this is my 10th year at Widener, and I've had – multiple guys that have been on the staff. Now, currently, I only have one guy on the staff that's been with me for five years. Our associate head coach, Kevin Berg, has been with me five years. Prior to that, though, I had a recruiting coordinator for four years. Prior to that, I had a pitching coach for four years. Like, So I've had guys that have stuck around long enough to build something pretty special and not just kind of moved on real quick before, uh, you know, kind of really having any value added. So, um, and, and, yeah, kind of as I mentioned earlier, like early on I learned how to delegate efficiently. Um I, at least I think so with those guys, and I still do that. Like I, I just look for guys that um, are really organized, very detail oriented, uh, whose coaching philosophy is kind of aligned with mine, and who have aspirations of um, making college coaching their career. And those guys are usually going to work really, really hard for not a lot of money because we don't have much to offer, you know. So, but those are the guys that understand like they're not getting paid in. You know, monetary dollars, they're getting paid in their experience and their development to hopefully open up doors. Um, the other great part about where we're located is the summertime recruiting circuit. We don't have to go far to recruit. So we can drop a pin on Widener, go three hour radius around, and we can see a ton of really great baseball players. So from a recruiting standpoint, those guys um, can get out recruiting a lot because we don't have to travel very far. We don't have to hop on planes. Um, we do all our recruiting regionally. And that uh, gives those guys opportunities to also get out. And then the camp circuit in the summertime, because we're so closely in close proximity to a lot of really good travel programs and college programs, there's a lot of paid recruiting opportunities or paid camps in the summer, too. So it gives those guys opportunities to earn extra money that kind of supplements what we are able to give them from wider as they kind of go through that the process of getting recruiting and college coaching experience. So um, 
it's a formula that's worked for us, and I think it's very unique to Wider. I think everywhere operates a little bit differently. There are certainly some similarities that parallel each other at other schools, especially small private uh, colleges like ours. However, um, just Widener, like we've got a lot of benefits geographically, as I said, and that kind of allows us to have a pretty good staff. Um, your question about uh, how many coaches we have on staff. So right now, uh, we've got five assist. I've got five assistants. So a uh, Associate head coach Kevin Burdick, he's the one who's been with me uh, for five years now. And then uh, recruiting coordinator, a pitching coach who uh, graduated from Widener, uh, and I coached in there 2015 grad. And then we've got another assistant, like kind of more of a volunteer basis, who was a recent grad uh, of Widener in 2019. And then one thing I did last year uh, is hired a strength coach on our coaching staff. So a guy that um, has a baseball background, was a collegiate pitcher. Um, now is in the strength and conditioning field and looking to you know make his career in collegiate athletics so we hired him to our staff uh, his name's joe kenny and he is phenomenal like he, his job is strength and conditioning he puts together all the programming for our guys he does all the testing he's in the weight room with our guys but like that's where his responsibilities lie so he's not a coach that comes to practice or games um but he is as valuable as anybody that we have on the staff. And I think it's just a way that we were able to kind of be creative with, with uh, that strength and conditioning uh, uh, position as well. That's very cool. And, you know, I, I've been, as a college coach, I coached at junior college and coached at the Division One level. And having five assistants like you have, gives gives you some amazing flexibility like what you were just saying there with just having one coach who's dedicated to the strength and conditioning side uh the couple stops that i had where we didn't have strength coaches you know the, co the, the coaches the baseball coaches are the ones that are putting together strength programs and uh -huh. you're the ones that are spending time in the weight room and frankly that was that was very challenging because you know for me i, I when i went to school we didn't have a great strength and conditioning program um and then all of a sudden like at, at one of our stops uh, at a junior college in North Carolina, it was like the other assistants and I were the strength coaches. And so, you know, over the years, I would contact former players of mine who were playing pro ball and just like, hey, w do you have a strength program you can send me? I just kind of wanted to keep it just for just to have. And all of a sudden, like I'm this other guy and I are, are tasked with putting the strength program together. And then just because of availability of the weight room, class schedules, practice schedules, like we're practicing or, or we're lifting at 6 a.m., several days a week so like you're on campus from you know 5 45 in the morning until after practice then you're sticking around for recruiting calls like you're there all day and uh and some of that stuff is just it, it, at least for me i felt like i was just kind of out of my element I, I was willing to do it but at the same time it was like boy i feel like i could be doing a lot of different i could be a lot more productive doing something else uh -huh. that was like in my wheelhouse so that's awesome that you've got that that's uh certainly one of the benefits and and just having the paid recruiting opportunities, paid, you know, uh, camp opportunities for guys, especially as a, as a young coach. I mean, I, I love those things. I ate those things up. If you get a chance to go see some players and get paid for it, you know, what could be better than that? Um, I'm curious to ask you, Coach LaRosa, when you're hiring an assistant coach, you, you talked about just giving your coaches a lot of autonomy. You really just kind of hand things over to them. Um, how... <laughs> How scary was that for you at the beginning, just as someone who, as a young head coach, I'm sure you wanted to make sure that you guys were successful and you were probably hiring people that maybe you didn't have a ton of experience with. Um, when you hired those guys, was it – did you let them run with their own philosophy and, and just kind of like – if it didn't 100% align with yours, you dealt with it, or did you lay out your philosophy first and they sort of had to get used to – to your philosophy and adapt that and over time like they sort of took things over on their own I'm kind of curious as to how even now you know when you first started in now how do you hire coaches do you hire guys that uh, and let them run with their own philosophy or, or hire guys and say hey, this is what we do and as soon as you learn it then it's you know it's it'll be all yours but you've got to learn our system first this is the widener way like how do you typically do that uh, yeah, so I do think there's two elements to that. There's definitely how I was when I first started with hiring assistants and how I am now, which is a little bit different, not a ton, but so early on, you know, you'd ask the question of like how scary that was uh, when I had first started. And like surprisingly, that, I don't know, I didn't have a fear over that. Um, maybe it's just because I was young and just like ignorance is bliss. Like I just didn't think about it. <laughs> you know, they might, um, 
or more than they would help. I don't know. But um, early on, basically what it was is I just through kind of the baseball community and, and just knowledge of, you know, who's out there, like just started talking to potential uh, guys that would be good assistants. And yeah, it was just the guys that end up coming on board were guys that I kind of knew enough about um, just their background, that they were good people. And then when we sat down and talked, a lot of our philosophies aligned and that's really what it came down to. So I like our pitching coach at the time, his name was Brian Campbell. I said he was a wide and a grad. Uh, I remember the day we met and we sat down and we talked pitching for two hours and like he taught me some he taught me a lot of things in that conversation so it's not like I was like this is the way we're doing it you gotta fall in line it was more like I believe our general philosophies aligned and then he had some really good ideas that he was bringing at the table and so and plus he was a wider guy so like it helped just ease the transition just so I could learn just how wider operates so you know, he was an easy hire and a guy that I just trusted because I knew, like, we just hit it off from day one and, and we really, I, I, I think our values aligned. Uh, then our recruiting coordinator, Dewey Orienti, was a young guy coming right out of college and, like, I was okay with him not having a ton of experience because I didn't have a ton of experience. Like, I had two years of college coaching experience, and which is rare. Like, I, I realized how rare, like, lucky I am that I, I got the opportunity to be, you know, get a head coaching job after after two years of, of experience, but um, he was another guy that, like, we just, our values aligned, we believed in a lot of the same things, he was our hitting coach, and, like, that lined up, and so it just kind of came together that it was a combination of, like, guys that I felt like, you know, we shared similar philosophies, and then they also had really good ideas that they were bringing to the table, and they had a system and a process that they were going to put in place, and we just kind of blended the two. Um where I am now in my career, I think the program itself is, um, so like early on, like you got to teach everything, right? So like new, new, new staff coming in, it's just like, it's like square one. We got to teach our offensive scheme. We got to teach, this is the way we thought. This is how we base run. Uh, you know, this is our pitching philosophy. This is how you clean up after practice. Like you just kind of like do it all. Now we're at a point where I feel like we've got like all the fundamental stuff is in place culturally like we don't have to spend time on like a lot of that like our, our upperclassmen know how to pass the torch down so now from a coaching standpoint like i look for guys that um one are going to be great recruiters like that's oftentimes an overlooked part for people that want to get into college coaching like and i tell those guys like listen you want to get a job like be a great recruiter because that's what everybody looks for um and then similarly, like guys that kind of have similar coaching philosophies, but more so like guys that I feel like they're bringing something to the table that we're not currently doing that's better, um, that's going to make an area of our program better. So, um, you know, with that, like how do I find that? Like, you know, the baseball community is small, so a lot of times, it, most of the time it's through word of mouth of, of guys that are out there and then just, you know, talking to people I trust that might recommend somebody um, and that way I kind of know if I'm getting a guy that, um, you know, is going to align with what I'm doing or not. It, it's more so just kind of the background check stuff of talking to other people. And um, and that way, again, like once they come in and we kind of, uh, you know, I say like, hey, this, this is what I believe in. Okay. And then they say, like, this is what they believe in. And we realize that there's a lot of matches. We can kind of blend it and just say, okay, this is how we're teaching it together. Boom, go. And I, I really feel like I don't have to give a ton of oversight. I just, you know, we talk a lot behind the scenes. I give my feedback. They give theirs. Um, and that's another important piece. Like, I don't want yes men. I want guys that are going to come in and, like, challenge ideas in the right manner, like behind the scenes, you know, um, in our offices, not in front of players. But guys that can bring a different perspective I think are so valuable because um, – you know, individually, we all kind of have flaws, and I, I know that there's certain things that I might have, you know, looking through my lenses, you know, need a fresh perspective, and, and getting guys that can look at the game in a different way, I think that is a major value added to the program. So, um, you know, again, I'm not necessarily looking for guys that are exactly like me, um, just that our morals are, are aligning, but hey, they, they might they might think totally different, and that's good. Um, and I think that's what, what ultimately can continue to allow the program to continue to grow and develop and not just get stale. I'll ask a sort of a spin-off question there. When you're hiring assistants now, are you hiring the best available guy you can find regardless of what his skill sets are or his 
um, his areas of most comfort, and then you sort of mix and match which coach is going to coach which part of the game, or are you hiring guys that are for a specific need? Uh, for example, you have a, maybe you have a coach who coaches like multiple defensive positions, and that's his specialty, and then he would leave. Are you going to hire a guy that does the exact same thing, or would you hire a guy that has a more of a hitting background and then figure out later later on who's going to coach which defensive position because that guy was the best candidate if that if that makes sense as a question yeah definitely so um i try to hire based on need so like if we need a pitching coach i'm looking for a pitching coach we need a hitting coach you know i'm looking for a hitting coach but it doesn't always work out perfectly like that it just you know it's just the way cards fall sometimes and that might just mean like okay if i've got a guy who is great at working with catchers but doesn't you know, can't work for infielders and outfielders, and, and we don't find an infield outfield coach, then maybe I just got to fill in and spend more time there. Um, and that's just kind of how we'll, we'll do it. Um, the strength coach position, for instance, like that was, uh, we kind of came to a conclusion a couple of years ago at the end of the season, like that was what we were missing because we don't have one at Widener. Um, and you know, guys were getting hurt, not like major stuff, but just like, you know, hamstrings, rolled ankles, like stuff that was just like nagging, keeping guys out. And I, we felt like just from a prehab standpoint, like we needed a strength coach. We needed to do testing. We needed to keep guys accountable there. Uh, and that was like a specific need and like found a guy that was perfect, like literally perfect. And that's what he was looking to do. And so um, that was fortunate. Like I might not always have that, but, uh, and there might need to be more flexibility sometimes. Um, but yeah, ideally we want to try and hire guys that um, fill a specific need um, because, you know, once, if there's too many voices, like it becomes white noise, like three hitting coaches, that's going to be a problem. Um, that's going to be really hard. You know? So uh, now, however, like we've got our head hitting coach and then, yeah, I'll work with the hitters. And we got another system that will work with the hitters, but we don't have three hitting coaches. We got one and, beyond that like it's a common voice we make sure like our terminology all aligns that we don't have somebody stepping in and working with a guy and saying something that he's never heard of before uh from our hitting coach you know so um it's blending the two and, and i think that uh, again it's worked for us and, and that's where we're you know it might not be for everybody but that's something that's worked for us at wider for sure you may have already answered this mike but how do you handle situations when uh, you you hire a guy that's on staff and then you have disagreements like maybe there's something even just as simple as bunting so you kind of said like at the beginning at the very beginning when you took over the program you're teaching everything and now some things are sort of established but maybe you bring in somebody else who just maybe has a different philosophy on bunting than you do um, how do you handle it with any assistant coaches when you have disagreements like I'm sure there have got to be things for you that are just sort of absolutes like this is this is what works. It's always worked, where I, and I want to keep doing it this way. Um, how do you handle disagreements that you have with assistant coaches philo philosophically? Yeah, so uh, what I tell our assistants is when I hire them and I continue to try and um, try and let them know frequently, I want to hear all their ideas and their feedback, um, and, and it's just got to be behind closed doors. So in our offices, over the phone, um, we never want to show a disagreement in front of players. Like, there's got to be unity. But I tell our guys, like, listen, we might, there might philosophically, there probably will be stuff that you've done differently or that you don't agree with, and let's talk about it. Um, my one rule is, like, you, you better have something to back it up. Like, nothing drives me more nuts than when a coach is like, I think we should try this. Okay, why? I just think it's worth, you know, taking a look at. Like, sorry, we're not going to implement something because we think it might be better. You know, like there's gotta be something valid, like that's backing and supporting uh, a statement. And so that's just all I ask from our guys. Like if they want to, you know, present a new idea uh, or a new way of doing things, like I want to hear it 100%, but I also want to hear like what backs that up and supports that statement. Um, and that's how we get better. Like, again, um, just because I see things one way doesn't mean it's always right. And to kind of your one point, like there's certain things that, yes, I am hard and fast on. Like I, I have a firm belief that there's certain things that when done and executed properly will always be successful at this level. Um, so if a coach, you know, were to kind of question some of that stuff, like I'll give them my 
why I back it up, why I support it. And I just tell those guys too, like, I want all your suggestions, but understand I might not take all your suggestions. There's certainly things that I'm going to say yes, and let's, let's roll with it. And there's definitely things I'm going to say, no, I want to continue doing it this way. And like, just, I, we can't have a guy that has thin skin. Like, like that can't hurt your feelings. You know, like it's not going to hurt mine when you tell me that you want to do something different. They're not hurt yours if I say no. Uh, and like, that's just a great open working relationship. Um, that it's just wonderful to have with staffs. So, and again, I've been really fortunate with just like unbelievable assistants that have understood that. And like, you know, we've been able to work really, really well together uh, when that stuff comes up. You mentioned early on in this podcast that when, when you took the job at Widener in order to achieve success very quickly two things were the most important to you player development and recruiting uh, let's talk about the player development side i think that that's a very uh popular thing in baseball today it's, you know with the explosion of analytics and the explosion of all these you know twitter coaches <laughs> yeah. um and, and you know the, the player development side is just something that gets a lot of attention when when you speak of player development and as you know, I I would say I would guess that when you have recruits in, you talk about player development frequently as something your program does and does well. When you talk about player development, Mike, for players in, for guys that come into Widener, can you just be more specific as far as, you know, what are gonna be some of your focal points for for developing players? What can a player expect? when he gets on campus with you guys as far as over the next over the course of the next four years, like this is this is where and how we're going to develop you as a player. Yeah, definitely. Um and it's a great question. Um kind of a loaded question because it all depends on like positionally and where a kid is at. Let's let's talk um, let's talk hitters first because you and I are both okay. hitting background. Let's just talk hitters. So a yeah. hitter comes to visit you guys, like what are some things that he should expect over the next four years? Yeah, so us, when we're recruiting hitters, um, they obviously already have a skill set that is workable. Um, so the big thing I want them to understand is, like, we're, we're not going to overhaul your swing. Um, if we needed to, we wouldn't recruit you. But there's going to be some minor adjustments, most likely, um, and what we use for those adjustments. So, you know, we use video work. We use blast motion sensors. Like, we've we phased in the technology piece. It's super important. Uh, most kids are using it before they get on a college campus. I have an idea of, you know, how it works. So I think that definitely needs to be considered uh, when you're talking about making mechanical changes to a kid. Um, the strength and conditioning piece is huge, obviously, regardless of position. So we're going to do baseline testing as soon as you get on campus. We're going to continue to test every four weeks in strength and conditioning areas. So that way, you know, you know, guys are going to increase bat speed and foot speed and, and unlock some immobilities that are going to allow them to do things that, you know, in their game they haven't been able to do before. Uh, so that's a huge piece of the player development program. Um, offensive approach is huge. You know, a lot of times um, it's, it's funny, like guys go through, you know, rough, rough streaks hitting and always want to look at like their, their swing and like, Oh, Hey, you know, I got to get film, you know, it's something in my mechanics. I got to change my stance, you know? And like half the time it's like, no, you're swinging at the wrong, you're taking the good pitches and you're swinging at the wrong ones. And like just fixing guys having a little bit of clear understanding of approach. And I think that's a big thing from an offensive standpoint um, that guys are able to really see improvement on because they understand, you know, they understand the game at a different level. Once they get taught, just, you know what pitchers are trying to do um, to get you out, and how do you kind of can, can combat that? Um, and then, so those are the those are you know huge cues. And then definitely um, the team itself. You know we've got great leadership. We've got guys that have bought into the system that are going to help our our younger guys. Uh, we have a mentorship program on our team, so our incoming freshmen have a team mentor who's a, a junior or senior, uh, ideally same major and same position if we can. So like you got they got somebody that's taking them under their wing from day one. Uh, they're gonna have a bunch of guys on their side right out of the gate. They're gonna help them with that development process. Um, and you know I, I think our programs uh, are when players are some of the best coaches, and like we definitely have that. We have a, we, our guys understand that like. They better be communicating in practice. Upperclassmen need to be leading drills, and, uh, you know, educating young guys and everything. And that goes a long way from development development standpoint. Um, we post results a lot, so like whatever it is, strength and conditioning results, bad eggs and velocity, 
blast data, like just giving guys feedback weekly so they can kind of see how they measure up. That creates a lot of competition within the team, which is cool to see and, and kind of motivates guys uh, to improve in certain areas. Um, also helps guys see like why certain guys are playing and why others aren't there yet, you know, just based on testing results. Um, so those are the main areas for sure. And uh, within the offensive philosophy, like, well, the big thing we want guys to understand is like there's a, there's a difference between um, developing a swing and developing an offense, and just having guys understand like how our offense operates and what the requirements are to work within it. And there might be guys that can get in a cage, and they can go through all the drill work beautifully. Uh, and there's a lot of guys that can do that because they've trained for a really long time to do a lot of that stuff. Um, but then get into a situational, you know, spot in a game and, and don't have the back control to be able to make an adjustment uh, to get a, get a job done, you know. So um, the selflessness piece is one that we recruit heavily and talk about in the recruiting process. So, like, yeah, we're, you're going to develop and your numbers are probably going to get better because everybody else is working inside this offense too in a certain way that, that helps everybody type of thing. So, um so it's a combination of all those things, uh, but those are some of the big ones that we hit on when we're having that conversation with recruits. I think that what you just touched on there, swing, swing mechanics versus approach, is something that uh, if you get too caught up in the riptide of social media, uh-huh. you, you you really forget about the approach side of things, and you can be convinced that there's one swing that is the swing yes. and yes. That, that that's the key to success. But, and this is honestly something, this is, this is like a legitimate question for me, Mike. And it yeah. makes me wonder as like a, as a former coach is hitting that much different than it used to be because when, when I coach and I, and I coach some really, really good offenses under some really, really good hitting coaches, um, you know, at, at Moorhead state, the year after I left, which was you know still all, still the same hitting philosophy and, and all, basically all the guys that I uh, was you know the recruiting coordinator for for that for all the classes that were there, they were uh, they that team at Moorhead State of all places led the country in like four or five offensive categories wow. and was in the top ten in, in several other categories like we could really hit I mean I know that year um, they went to play San Diego. And San Diego is a is a is a really good, you know, Division One team from year to year. Where Chris Bryant played, and um, and, and that I read an interview that said that that coach at the end of the season was talking about like some of the games, and he went back to the Moorhead State series of like the second series of that whole year and said, but I, he said something 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 along the lines of, but maybe the best offense we played all year might have been Moorhead State. Like they could really wow. really hit. So that they were a really good offensive team. I guess point being that you know I was I was a part of some really good offenses, but now just with this with everything that you hear on social media, it makes you wonder has has hitting or teaching hitting changed that much where the way that I would have coached wouldn't work anymore because when I did coach it was much more much more about approach mentality pitch selection understanding which pitches you could handle and which you did not understanding the situation of the game and and all of those things and that's really yeah. what made good hitters good hitters do you think that that's still the same now or Ha- have things changed to where I-, I guess swing mechanics really are that much more important? You know, because I guess now just looking at the major leagues, we'll just start from there because things trickle down. In the big leagues, yeah. guys are basically a-, a lot of guys, not every guy, but a lot of guys in the big leagues are trying to hit the ball as far as they can sure. every pitch, and that's kind of their approach. And, and to me, that's not an approach that I was uh, that that I've seen work or, or that really has I've ever seen taught at the college game. Is that changing at the college level or is the college level still similarly similarly taught to how it was when you hit? Obviously, you were an excellent hitter. Um, have things changed a lot as far as in the college game, as far as teaching hitting and what goes into making good hitters and, and ultimately what produces a good offense, which you you know as a as a coach sometimes a good hitting team is not always a good offensive team so can you just talk a little bit about what you know in your opinion what makes a good offense right now and has that changed over the years yeah that's an awesome question so um 
it has changed. Like, it's definitely changed since when I played. I think we have way more knowledge and understanding of how the swing works biomechanically. Um, we have way more data to understand, you know, what counts are, uh, you know, best, you know, from a hitting standpoint and, and optimal, like, swing type counts. Obviously, the so the players like yes they're, they're they've got they're flooded with information okay most players coming into college they've had a hitting coach so like they've gotten lessons from a hitting coach most players are on twitter uh and social media and see all the same stuff that you and i do um and there's so much contradictory information because everybody can be a coach you know on social media like it so from that standpoint i do think our guys are getting overwhelmed with information i think they're I think they have a better knowledge and understanding of how it works than I ever did, um, and, you know, which 20 years ago as a, as a college player. Um, but teaching how an offense can be successful, I do think is still taught in similar ways. So what I mean by that is, like, I don't think hitting coaches should be called hitting coaches. I think they should be called offensive coordinators, just like how in football, like, because – there's a swing coach, but most of our guys have swing coaches when they come in. So that's the tough part is, like, if, if you want to overhaul a guy's swing, like, my personal opinion is that's not a guy to recruit because it's going to be really hard. Like, you want to overhaul it, but then he's going to go home over winter break and he's going to work with his hitting coach. He's going to go home over summer break and work with his hitting coach. And now you've got a guy that's just really, really confused if you're teaching something different, you know. Um, so there's, like, certain – I just think basic fundamental things of getting a guy in a proper position to hit that are that are very important that I think everybody would probably agree on like certain fundamental things maybe not everybody but the masses you know um, beyond that like I think teaching how an offense works um, and why I say it's an offense coordinator is like everybody's got a different scheme like there's certainly guys that have like you know big physical guys middle of the order bats that can leave the yard on every any given pitch and like those are those are the types of guys that they're not putting guys in motion. They might not be playing small ball. Like they're depending on driving ball and, and doubles and home runs. And then there's other teams that are smaller and speed teams, and you know have a different type of skill set that are they're bunny running and putting guys in motion. So like that's the beauty of this game, and I love is that every team has its own style of play and recruits to that style of play, which is like so unique and special. Major League Baseball, yeah, like you said, it's different. Like you know they're not doing those things guys are trying to leave the yard and I don't blame them like you know like they're not going to make their money hitting a backside ground ball to move a runner that's an 0 for 1 in the in the box you know they're going to make their money on on slugging percentage OPS so like that's what the that's what the major league game has gone to and I understand uh, our game like we're not there we're amateur like we're we're not there yet so I, I think we can as more positions to steal bases, uh, to work counts, to have a two strike approach, all that kind of stuff, you know. And that's the fun part of like offensive development. Um, that's different program to program. And like we've all seen programs that are successful in both areas as a small ball team that like grinds out of bats and as a, you know, free swing team that, that can leave the yard. Like we all know like there's both there's programs with both of those things on opposite sides of the spectrum that can be super super successful so it's just figuring out like what works for you what type of players can you recruit can you recruit to your offense and i think that's the biggest thing like i personal opinion i think there's shortcomings when coaches just try to stockpile talent with no real clear understanding of how that talent's going to play inside of a system so like if i'm just trying to go out there and get the best swingers like how does that play like can they can they get a read on the bases? Like, what's their foot speed like? I mean, I think of a guy that we, we had a couple of years ago. Like, probably best guy metrics-wise, um, big and physical, can drive the ball, uh, can leave the yard. And, like, but if he gets on first base, he's stuck. We need three base hits to get him home. That guy, <laughs> like, he kills our offense because what can you do with him, you know? And, like, it's – a guy hitting eight home runs helping you win that many games. Like if you're playing a 40 plus game division three schedule and a guy hit eight, hits eight home runs, that's a really high number of home runs. It's a successful season. But how many games is that translating to wins? You know? So those are the things that I kind of think about um, when recruiting. So like if we see a guy that's like, okay, he's got a big bat, but he can't run. 
bad body and doesn't have a position. Like, what are you supposed to do with that guy? DH him and then pinch on for him after a second of bat. Like, it's, it, you know, like he just leaves you no options. But the guy that has some bat control can run, uh, understands, like, his athletic and pace, so, like, can understand, like, how to make some adjustments that are going to make him better offensively. Like, those are the guys that we found success with. Um, and I think play into, personally, like, just our offensive philosophy at Widener. Um, and certainly have passed on guys that maybe, like, again, looked apart, um, are going to be high in, like, the measurables, um, but can't really do anything else, you know. So I think teaching, you know, like, I, I don't think that part of it's really changed. Um, the swing part definitely has, but um, last, last point to that, like, as a coach – Nowadays, I just think players are smarter. Like, they have a better understanding. And, like, if you're going to teach something, you better be prepared to explain it. And um, uh, that way, you don't, in your eyes, in a player's eyes, you're validated, you know, incredible. Um, and that's the part that I think has changed, whereas it didn't used to be like that. Like, players weren't coming into college so educated on how the swing works as they are nowadays. And, like, pitching too like i mean pitchers have so much more so many more resources now that they're coming in and, and have a good understanding of just how their body works uh you know how to develop pitch sequences and all that sort of stuff that once upon a time like that stuff was taught by a college coach like okay this is how we're going to attack hitters you know and now guys know how to like like you know uh, because they have technology uh, a lot of them they utilize it to the high school process travel ball process like so they're coming in with an understanding of just how their pitches, you know, match up and how to, you know, how to develop pitch sequence and all that kind of stuff. So, um, yeah, long, long-winded answer, <laughs> but uh, that, that's kind of, I think that's kind of it. Well, that was a good one, and and it's, I'm glad I asked because it's just, uh, it's something that, that changes, and guys that have been in the college game for a long time or even probably in high school, coaching high school for a long time, have had to make those adjustments as players have changed. You know, either you've got to change or you're going to lose the ear of a lot of players, I'm sure. Yes. Now, when you and I played and, and uh, early in, in my coaching career, I, I started coaching uh, a little while before you did. I, I think that players... Players like to know what your background was. You know, they like to know what kind of success you had or that or that you were able to do some certain things or, or whatever. I, I think players had more respect the higher level you played or or the better stats you put up. Or, like, if a guy played pro ball, it was like, oh, okay, I'd, they would rather listen to this guy that played pro ball who had no coaching experience than, you know, someone with no pro experience who's been coaching for a long time and has had success. Do, is that something that's changed? Because, uh, and I'll ask that as someone that had a great college career uh, and, and got a chance to play professionally, which not a lot of Division Two players get a chance to do. Uh, players today, even compared to when you started coaching in college, do they care about your background? Or has that is that another thing that's changed where now they care about basically your – your technical knowledge of of the swing and and things like that like that's that seems to be obviously what's uh where a lot of a lot of focus is so do they care as much about what your playing background was or are they much more concerned with uh how how technically you can talk to them about what's happening with their swing and why it's happening and how they can get better with that yeah i think it's the latter um the reason i say that so you know, I meet with a lot of recruits and families and have a lot of conversations. And I get the question a lot, like, where did you play? Where did you go to college? And I'm kind of always surprised because, like, my bio is online. And, like, I would have been the person that would have probably looked up the coach's bio before I went and met with him. Like, I'm not saying that's right or wrong. I just, I'm just surprised that so many people don't. And that's why it makes me think, like, they don't really care. Like, they don't care where you came from. They care what can you bring to them. Like, how can you help them? And that's the main thing. So I think, yeah, maybe like an ex-pro player, he's going to have a little credibility, a little more credibility walking into the room. Um, but that's it. I think it stops there. And at that point, you know, it's human nature prevails. And the players just want to know, like, how can you help me? Are you going to care about me? You know, are you going to care about my own development? So I think, 
I think that's um, what I found, uh, you know, that's probably changed. Um, and, you know, to that end, like, it kind of goes back to what I was saying earlier. Players are really smart. Like, they are educated on how things work. Um, so if you can't support your statements um, and or, like, answer their questions uh, regarding, like, you know, the breakdown of pitching mechanics or hitting mechanics, you'll probably lose credibility, and that doesn't, regardless of what your background is. Um, so, yeah, you know, I think that that's probably um, probably pretty true of a statement, at least at least in the guys that we deal with. Yeah, I think it's probably true across the board, and part of the reason that I um, maybe kind of assumed that, and I and it's just, it took a, a while to maybe put this. Uh, hypothesis together, but even looking at who gets hired at, in pro ball now, yeah. Uh, again, when when yeah. you when when you played and and when I you know when I first started coaching, I liked the recruiting piece was was probably my favorite part of coaching. I I would I liked recruiting more than I liked even coaching on the field, and I kind of kicked around, you know, trying to get into pro scouting when I first started. But honestly, at that time, it was like if you didn't play pro ball, you you, you almost had no shot of getting yes. a scouting job. Yeah. And now that seems to be uh, almost irrelevant. And even and even as far as coaching in the minor leagues, it seemed like at that time, if you're going to be a pro coach, you you basically needed to be a pro an ex player, or else it wasn't going to happen for you. And now yeah. you see guys all the time. And this trend just started in the last couple of years that these pro organizations are nabbing all these college coaches that are going to pro ball that that didn't have a pro background, or guys that are going from like you know being a Division three coach, never played pro ball, and now they're coaching in pro ball. And that just wasn't a trend that was around. So I, you know, I kind of wondered. I, I guess just thinking about that okay is that because the players now care more about your technical knowledge and they care about your background so they don't they're not going to flinch at the fact that you don't have a pro background as long as you can keep up with them in a conversation and you can teach them something like they're in they're going to listen yeah um, i think it's a good point uh, that i hadn't really thought of and it's certainly possible um you know that I guess I really don't know though. Like I would be speculating this to say like, uh, yeah, that's probably that is the way it is, or it's not. Um, but it's, it's a good theory. Um, it definitely makes a lot of sense, Jeff. Who knows? Yeah. <laughs> Who knows if I'm right or wrong on that? But just I don't know. Something I had in my mind and just kind of wondered sure. what the experience was like, just recruiting wise. If that's if that's changed uh, for you, even you know, in, in the ten years, twelve years that you've been coaching, uh, if that's something that changed, or if that's been been fairly consistent. Uh, uh, on the recruiting side of things, Coach Larosa, I'm I'm curious to know. You've talked about just about the culture now at Widener being something that, that sort of takes care of itself because you've been there for a long time and, and you've been the one consistent. So now the upperclassmen um, almost sort of sort of steer that ship, which I think is true for a lot of good programs. Uh, you know, going up and down your roster, it seems like you have almost exclusively high school players as opposed yes. to junior college players. Now is that is that on purpose because you think that has a lot to do with the the culture and philosophy uh, just sort of taking care of itself or yourself? Is that something that's because of just academic requirements at Widener? Um, or, or is there any, any specific reason behind that recruiting-wise? I mean, is it that important for you to have a guy for four years as opposed to two, or is there something else involved? Yeah, it's, um, it's just who we are at Widener. Um, we, it's tough to get transfers into Widener uh, academically, and if we do get them in academically, it's tough to put together a financial package that usually works. Um, the reason it's tough to get guys in academically, or not just get students in academically, um, not that they can't get accepted, but it's the acceptance of credits. The credits that we take oftentimes aren't as many as other schools are going to take, and that's where... I used to, early on, uh, my, probably my first five years at Widener, I really tried uh, to go after the transfer market and, and kind of chase a lot of players. And it was just like, we just had zero success. I mean, every now and then we got a guy. But really, the only four-year transfers, or I'm sorry, the only transfers we get are four-year guys that transfer to Widener because it's the right fit academically. It's like a mechanical engineering major um, or something like that. The two-year transfers, I think we've had three of them in is my 10th year um so that's really why it really doesn't have anything to do with a personal coaching philosophy um now that 
being said, if I could bring in transfers, I would. Not a ton of them, but like if we could get one or two or maybe even three impact type guys um, that are coming in with college level experience, you know, at a local uh, two year school, I would definitely do it Um, because I think those guys can fill immediate needs, which sometimes you have. And now relying on a freshman, you're gonna you're probably gonna have to work through some growing pains. Um, So if I was in a situation where I could, I would get some, but not a ton. For the reason that you just said, like the fact that we have so many four-year guys, the culture is in place. Um, I wouldn't say that like it necessarily takes care of itself. Like it still needs work to be like to continue to foster that culture. But we have guys that really understand it. Like our junior seniors totally get it and like know and understand why we do what we do, and they can relay that to the underclassmen very easily. Um, whereas transfers coming in, they you know, are a little bit more set in their ways and not in a bad way. They just, they've probably had success at the collegiate level already. So if they have, they're not going to be as willing to change. Um, so it's okay to have a couple of guys on that, that couple of those types of guys on the roster, I think. Um, but too many, uh, that could be a little, that could be challenging. That could probably cause some problems uh, internally amongst the team, you know? And the other thing to that point, like, because we have, recruit so many freshmen i do feel like if we all of a sudden like okay january comes and and there are these new guys that show up like i would think that as a coach you'd probably lose trust with some guys that are already in the program that have worked really hard to get to a certain point and now you've just brought somebody in to start over them like i would i know if i was a player i probably wouldn't like that very much so that's kind of my uh yeah so again like because academically and just our requirements, it's tough to get transfers as it is. Not that I would bring in a ton, but I probably would bring in more than you know, the zero that we do. <laughs> so, <yeah. laughs> I, I know that there's a, a specific situation that I can remember where, where we did that at one of the junior colleges where I coached. We brought in some players for the spring semester, and, and you know we, we felt like as a coaching staff we needed to bring some guys in, but um, there, there's such a – there's a lot to think about as as coaches you you know doing the right thing for the wins and loss record is not always the right thing for the players um the players that are already on the team and and obviously like you said it it can hurt some of the relationships that you've got and it's um there's a lot there's a lot that goes into that that probably a lot of people just don't think about that as uh as a head coach particularly as a recruiting coordinator you know sometimes as a recruiting coordinator i i took the philosophy or took the mindset that you've got to treat your your roster like it, it's it's your business because in, in a way you do you know to keep moving up and moving on and and to to have more opportunities you've got to win but uh you know at the same time i i, I do i think the older i've gotten and not that I, again i'm not on the field coaching now but the older i've gotten the more that the relationship with the individual players matters not that i wouldn't do the same type of thing but maybe at least have conversations with guys that this is why this is happening and this is how this is going to affect you instead of just like, Hey, here's a new guy. Good luck to everybody. <laughs> you know, right. um, yeah. Mike, you, you've talked about this in a couple ways, but I'd like to ask you to sort of as a, as a way to wrap this up uh, in the last couple minutes of this, just kind of how you've progressed as a head coach. You, you were not, you know, a young uh a young guy when you know 22 years 23 when you first got your college your your first coaching job but you were very young when you got your first head coaching job can you just kind of talk about maybe some specific ways that you've progressed as a head coach from when you first got to widener july 2011 spring of 2012 was your first spring until right now just how far you've come some things that that you've uh, some some areas you've progressed, things maybe you've changed your mind on from the beginning until yeah. right now. Just kind of curious as to to how uh, coaches progress in different ways. Yeah, definitely. So I think it's in a lot of ways. I, I have um, I have changed, um, and the reason is, I mean, there's a lot of reasons. But early on, so I only had two years uh, experience as an assistant coach, so I I really didn't have like a ton of stuff to model. And therefore, when I came in to Widener, I kind of had like my own plan based off of mostly what uh, our team did when I was at Westchester, because we, you know we were successful and I had really great coaching there, and that was kind of my like 
this is the script. Like, this is how we're going to do it. And I was very um, rigid on it. Um, probably like, and, and because I was young, I was probably like so overly um, cautious just in like how I handled everything. Maybe not cautious the right way, but like, like I disciplined everything. Like I had so many rules, you know, and it's like, because I was so badly like, wanted to make a good first impression and being young like I wanted to kind of set a standard of like listen I might be close in age with you guys but I'm your coach like I'm going to demand respect like type of type of mentality which was just it was just not the right mentality like looking back like I understood at the time why I did it but as I've evolved and now I've gotten to the point I've just realized like so much players will see right through it if you're trying to be something you're not and you have to be yourself so when I was 28 and got hired, like I needed to act like my 28 year old self instead of 40 year old coach that I thought I needed to act like, you know? And that was the big transition for me. I felt like over time, I've just, I've, I've recognized and remembered that like they're 18 to 22 year old kids. And I remember how I was when I was that age. Um, and I give guys more leniency than I probably did um, early on because I was forgetful of that. It was really bizarre. It's like, I didn't, I didn't remember that like young guys make mistakes, you know? So now I feel like I'm at a point where like, listen, the expectations are late. I've probably cut like my rules. We have a little code of conduct sheet. I probably cut that in half, Jeff, to be honest. Like I had so many rules and I, I've just stepped back. And the other thing that I had to really change on is I played at Westchester university, division two program. And like, the top national program year in and year out. The guys that play in that program have a different mindset about baseball than the guys that are at Wagner University that are biomedical engineering majors. So my guys who are not on athletic scholarship, who truly are just playing for the love of the game and academically are uh, very, very challenged at Wagner. Like it's, 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 it's tough academically. If I'm not making baseball enjoyable for them, they're going to quit. Because what's the point, right? So, like, I have, I felt like just, I backed off and just showing my cards, been myself, and tried to make it an enjoyable process for those guys where they look forward to coming to baseball every day. Not that they don't work hard, because they definitely do, but I think just creating an environment where, like, they, they want to work hard inside of. And early on, I don't think I did a good enough job of that. Now, what I'll say is, like, yeah, we won early, and we won quick, but... It was not sustainable, and if you've looked, you know looked at our records over the years, like we were going up in the right direction, and then we dropped, and that was the reason. Um, and I'm almost certain of it. It just wasn't sustainable. And I feel like now we've gotten to a point where um, I just have a better relationship with players. Um, I feel like they're more open and discussing things with me. I think that because of that, they have more ownership within the program, um, and have relayed that. You know, that question, I relay that to the younger guys, um, you know, and kind of their actions and what they do. So th that's the biggest thing um, that I feel like I've kind of evolved in and I'm certainly still working at. Um, but, uh, but yeah, I kind of think back to like when I started, I uh, shake my head, just like thinking about the way I acted sometimes, you know, and it was just, you know, I was just, again, trying to be somebody I wasn't. And, um, you know, I, I definitely made those mistakes early on. I think we've all been there trying to be something you're not or trying to, you know, be uh, uh, my, my first job as a hitting coach, recruiting coordinator, I was 23 and I was trying to be the 40 year old coach that you're talking about at, at 23 and trying to really separate myself. And part of it was because you're such a, now I was at a Juco, but I was still, you got 19, 20 year olds on that team. Uh, probably some 21, 22 year olds um, thinking back to it. But uh you know, I, if I could go back, I would probably say to some of the same things that we're talking to a young coach, just, just be who you are. Yes. You, you yes. obviously, you have to separate yourself. You can't mm -hmm. fraternize with the players necessarily, mm -hmm. but you're allowed to be 23, 25, 28, whatever you are. Like that's the, the players wow. know that's who you are and, and you just finished playing and, yep. um, yeah, great stuff. Mike, one last thing. I, I just want one last question. Just, uh, I don't know for fun. If, if there was one thing that you wish more people knew about you, so people who know you as a coach, 
And this is another thing that, that coaches know, maybe people that aren't coaches don't necessarily know, but people that you see on the road a lot, like the you know, the coaches that you see, people that know you just as Mike the baseball Mike LaRosa the baseball coach. Um if there was one thing that you wish they would know about you just uh, personally that you think um you know make a difference to people or just something that's important to you that that doesn't necessarily get a lot of attention at, in the baseball world is there, if there was one thing what would that be that you would like people to know about you man that's a good question <laughs> um yeah like i don't know i guess yes people know me as i guess a baseball coach so i think i'm looked at in that light you know when i'm in that that realm when i'm in that field um I guess one thing, so I, I listen to a lot of these type of podcasts, which I think are awesome, and just kind of hearing other coaches talk, and, and I've tried to read books of you know successful coaches, and I think you've probably heard this a lot too, like older coaches say all the time, I wish I spent more time with my kids, and wish I watched them grow up more, and I just felt like I've heard that theme constantly, so my big thing is like my family is just my number one priority, and even though like I put in a lot of time certainly with the baseball program and and everything else, like my first love is my family. And I think people might, I mean, that seems obvious, but I think people might be surprised that's because I I am super passionate about the game and and about our program. But like when I'm not around it, um, like I like to shut it off. Like I like to just be with my family, be with my kids. Like my life's not super exciting. It's just just baseball and that. Um, and I'll play like bad round of golf every now and then too. But, um, that's the biggest thing. Like, I just didn't want to ever be one of those guys that, like, is 60 years old coaching and looking back and saying, like, I wish I didn't miss my kids growing up. So, like, I feel like because of that, I probably, um, you know, I, I make a lot of decisions where, like, my family's going to come first and, like, there's certain things that are going to be put off and it might be recruiting calls. It might be things that are super important. But, um, you know, I, I guess – that's my number one priority. Like, I just don't want to ever have made that mistake. Uh, and I don't know. I think that's just good for, in general, just just overall mental well-being too, you know, so. And, and that is a very difficult thing for people that are in it. And I don't think you need to be a baseball coach to be in that situation. If, if yeah. you're, you know, trying to run a business, if you are um, – especially trying to start your own business or, or you're coaching something or you just have passions elsewhere. It's, it's very easy to get caught up in that, especially when you're in a competitive environment. Mm-hmm. You know, I can remember it's like, a, when you're on the road sitting next to guys, it's like a badge of honor for some guys basically to talk about how much they work, the hours they put in, and in the time, the amount of time they spend away from home and and especially in the recruiting season. And it's very easy as a young coach to think that's the only way. Yeah. If I want to make it, that's the only way to do it. Yeah. And, and it's very refreshing to me any time that I hear someone say what you just said. Um, so I personally appreciate that a lot. I appreciate that perspective. Yeah. And I hope that there's someone listening to this who – just realizes that you can have success and have a good family life. And those things, those things can coexist, which sometimes you get the impression that they cannot. So I I appreciate that a lot from you. Yeah, no. And that's, thank you for the feedback. And just to your point about young coaches feeling like you got to work all the time. I guess what I would say is with that, before I had kids, I kind of told you my schedule, like, yeah, I was burning the candle at both ends, but I know that if I had kids, I would not have done that. And like, so yes, as young coaches, if there are any that, that are listening to this, um, try and do it. Like you, you got to put the hours in when you're young, you know, and, and you're unattached and you don't have those, those family responsibilities yet. So hopefully once you do get to the point where you have a family, you're at a level where, um, you can prioritize your schedule a little bit more. And it's so funny what you say about like the badge of honor with guys like talking about like how much they work and like being away from the family and all that. Cause I'm with you. Like that is not, um, I don't know. I, I, it's just not part of my value system. I guess not that it's wrong for somebody else or not. It just, um, again, like that piece, I just feel like I've, I've heard those warnings too many times to not let it hit home a little bit. So, but you know, but yeah, thank you for the feedback. 
It's all really good stuff. This is Mike LaRosa, everybody. He's the head coach at Widener University, uh, Division three school in Pennsylvania, and, and someone that I've really gotten – to know a little bit and have really enjoyed my time with him. Uh, I, I was actually I was there with him when he shot uh, his his first round of videos at on the Figured Out website, and I you know enjoyed getting known that day. And and again in this podcast, there's a lot, always a lot to learn from people. And Mike, I just see you as somebody that's got a lot of old school left in him, but but a but a good progressive mentality, and probably someone who's a lot of fun to play for. Um, I think you know mature beyond your years and, and a, bring a great perspective, very well rounded coach with. Uh, that just probably is wise beyond your years. Just a lot to learn from you and all around. So, Coach LaRosa, sincerely appreciate the time uh, you put into the podcast today, and hopefully we can continue to have you be uh, part of Figured Out Baseball going forward. Yeah, definitely. Thanks a lot, Jeff, for the kind words and, and for having me on. Um, I really appreciate it. It was a lot of fun.